What's up, good coach? How you doing, man? Shit, bro. Congratulations, because y'all an amazing job. That's what locker room is, though. And to be to have a sort of atmosphere where you can bring a, bring in dudes off the street and have that chemistry, that starts with you, man. That's wow. a, that's amazing. I appreciate bro. you saying that, but that's dope. These new talent. You know, I would love to get on TV and say, hey, that I do, but nah, man, it was undeniable. I actually saw some National Cleveland fans in the hotel, and so they were digging okay. at me. Yeah. And I was like, I'm gonna be honest with y'all, man. I was like, if y'all can't be excited about what that team did last yeah. year here, I was like, y'all ain't real fans. Every year stands on its own merit. It's a new yeah, year. New year. It's it's a new year's year. got nothing to do with it. Every day's an interview. Right? Yes, right. sir. Right. There's a line out the door of people that want our jobs. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. You yeah. lived it. Yep. Oh, this, the song, that's kind of clean. Yeah, that's kind of clean right there. That's rich people stuff. Hey, clean mink on it. Hey, you know that's that's money. That's money. Oh, that's money. He bought that from Greece or something. Hey, you know he was in Greece somewhere and he was like, man, I'm gonna get these first. You see you, bro. What's up, Sam? All was good. Good to see you. Put my shoulders back. What's up, big dog? You got it. Walking up like this. Good to see you, brother. What's up, dog? How you doing? Oh, what up, bro? How you doing, baby? What are you doing? Can't complain. How about you? Good, good. Everything good with you? Obviously, her story, but she just has like great wisdom mm -hmm. on it in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll ask the guys if they just have any questions. I mean, I can't tell you what it's like to be her yeah. or to be any woman in that position. But sometimes if you can tap into that, that empathy of guys for their, their mother or for their sisters or whatever it is by speaking to a woman, I think it could be really effective. Hold up, limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way up in it, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust, limitless, take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way up in it, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Uh, knowing me, I got the key. Uh, on the vision, I can trust. Uh, trust. Uh, limitless. Take a stomach cow, pin in it. I thought they hear the witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Uh, way I'm feeling, got me up. Uh, just the hallway? Just the hallway. They're going to take us through a conversation. Take a seat, sir. Thank you. What we see? <laughs> we, see. we got these three. three yup. First three. Yeah. What up, fellas? How y'all doing, man? Good. Uh, shoot, you'd have told me a few years back I'd be in a Cleveland. Uh, meeting room. Hey, we see your sneakers. Well, Coach, this is the colors of the podcast, Coach. You know what I'm saying? This is the colors of the, colors of the podcast, guys. Listen, I watched all y'all walk in. I don't want no smoke. I am not. I'm, them days are over for me, man. But honestly, bro, we appreciate you guys having us. This is something we do not take lightly. It's an honor to be here. We sat in these same seats. I also know minicamp ain't the place y'all want to stay for extra meetings for a very long time. Uh, but I do believe that this is extremely important, along with us having an opportunity to speak with you guys about domestic violence. We have one of your brothers, DeAndre Hopkins. His mother is here. She has uh, a tragic but fascinating story of triumph. And I believe when you listen to her and you hear some of the things that she went through, the way she's, she was able to persevere, you know, you could see your mother, you could see your sisters, you could see your daughters. And I mean, I think it's the same thing whenever we have these conversations, we have to take ourselves out of this masculine, manly place and put ourselves in the position of being abused, whether it's mentally, uh, verbally, emotionally, or physically, you know, which we can see the bruises and we can see those scars, but the scars of what those people have gone through, what those women have gone through and those traumas, those things don't heal um, as easily. And so uh, I know Channing and Fred want to say something as well, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you. And I know how important this is to us. I know it's important to you as well. And uh, we hope you take something from it. Yeah, what's up, fellas? Um, Fred Taylor, man. Um, I went to the University of Florida. So I'm a Gator, won the first national championship there. I got to hear from this guy a million times about what LSU doing is these days. I'm sure y'all probably tired of hearing it too. But I played 13 years total, 11 in Jacks, two in New England. The last two was for a cup of tea, so I really didn't do much there. But in Jacksonville, I put in hell. So a lot of y'all young boys, y'all probably go watch YouTube and check my highlights out. Uh, they ain't yeah. black and white, though. Nah, they ain't black and white. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. 
Uh, last year, somewhere in December, I was kind of a little pissed off that y'all took down my jack, but y'all deserved it. Y'all earned it. So uh, way to go. Congrats on the season. Yeah, you caused hell, too, you and Joe. Uh, but yeah, that, that's re really it about me, man. Um, just had a really good career, but it goes by quick. You know, it goes by quick. A lot of times, um, and this is also a piece of what I wanted to add to what we were going to say today. A lot of times we, we underestimate the power of our influence because we overestimate how much time we have. Like, you're in these chairs now, and you think it's just going to be a, you know, a smooth ride. It's never that. It's going to always be a roller coaster, and before you know it, it's going to be over with. And you'll be looking back like me. I've been retired since 2011. So that's, that's been 13 years. On top of the 13 years since I played, I came in in 98. But take advantage. Build as many friendships as you can right now, as many relationships. Because when the game is done, that's what you're going to have to be able to hang your hat on. You're going to have to be able to sustain those relationships over the course of your entire life because you just never know who you're befriending along the way. You never know who's watching, especially in this day and age, every fucking body's watching. I was just talking to Deuce outside, and we was talking about Walter Payton and how he became great. He did it away from cameras. And then what you saw was the end product of him working away from cameras. And again, put it into work when nobody's watching. Learn the discipline, learn habits. You know, because they're going to always be the one thing that comes to the forefront, and that's what people are going to always judge you on, which eventually is your character, right? So I know I kind of went a little long-winded, but I always speak from my heart, and I think it's important for y'all to take that, receive it, and hope replicate that and share that with the next generation of guys that's going to be in these seats. That's the longest damn intro in the history of time. <laughs> 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 I uh, see what I got. I, I got to deal with this shit. <laughs> Man, I'm Tanner Crowder. Played for the Gators, left 05, played six years. Well, I got a credit for seven, only played six because they owe me some money on the back end. Really, man, football was cool. I, I didn't take it as serious as I should have. That's one of the things I preached to everybody. Like, I didn't take it as serious as I should have. I messed around. I was running the streets. I was in Miami. <laughs> I'm going to point at you. But I... <laughs> <laughs> I was in Miami, man. I was out every night. I, 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 I played football like I worked at Walgreens. And I don't have a, I really did. Like, once I got off the clock, like, it was like my shift was over. Like, coach, meeting's done. I'm out. I'm hitting the streets, really. And it's one I don't regret a lot in my life. I had a great life, good, you know, doing well in life. But I do regret not taking football more serious. So from the beginning of it, I tell y'all, man, this little window, if it's a 13-year window, 14-year, 10, 8, 6, 5-year window, man, maximize it because when it's done, your ass can't get out there no more. Them boys going to get bigger and stronger and faster than y'all. Y'all going to get older and slower. And that check going to stop coming. And the prestige going to stop coming. Them lights going to go off. And you don't want to have any regrets at the back end of it. But that's, that's it. Yeah, Gators, Dolphins, yeah. Party. <laughs> Well, I'm going to be really, <laughs> I'm gonna be really quick because we have somebody that's much more important. Uh, I'm Ryan Clark, played 13 years. I was undrafted, uh, came a pro bowler, won a Super Bowl in Pittsburgh. Uh, honestly, what I'm doing now is much more important. You know, I get to raise my babies. I get to be an example for them every day about hard work and about being disciplined and about being dedicated to something, no matter what it is. Like right now, you guys get to do something you did for free your entire life until this point. You know, I know a lot of us always say like we found or find our why eventually. The why is because you actually love doing this job, right? Like the people who go to like nine to fives or who work these jobs that are thankless and you don't get fame for, those are the people who need to find a why to go to work. Your why is because you love it and you want to win a championship. And once this is over, you do not get opportunities to get wins and losses. The greatest thing about this is no matter how hard you work during the week and whatever you put into it on Sundays, Thursdays, Mondays, or Wednesdays, whenever Roger wants y'all to play as we go forward, you know how well you did, right? I miss that. You don't get that. Don't, don't take that lightly that y'all get to do something that people really care about, but that brings y'all all together as a brotherhood. 
But the reason I say that what I do now is more important is because of what we're about to get an opportunity to do. Right, like I played this game at the time I played it and the way I played it and I poured everything into it because it was the most important thing in the world to me outside of family. Because I did that this way, I now get an opportunity to sit with somebody like Miss Sabrina Greenlee and talk about something that's way more important than snapping footballs, catching touchdowns, kicking field goals, right? Like when we go home, man, the things that we have are our last names. That's it, right? Like when I pass, it's going to be the way I made people feel, right? And the, the legacy that I leave from the way that I treated others, right? And the way that we do that is we listen to people who have been through things and we learn from them. So without further ado, I want to introduce Ms. Sabrina to you guys. Ms. Sabrina Greenlee, we're going to have a conversation about domestic violence. All right, guys, so uh, we're going to get started here. I think first, I just want to say thank you for taking your time. Thank you for your strength, your vulnerability, your openness, and willingness to sit in this forum and share your stories. Um, I think the first question I want to start with is uh, people have had opportunities to read and to learn about the incident that took your sight. Mm -hmm. But you experienced abuse far before that. Can you talk about your first time being a very young girl and being taken advantage of and sexually assaulted by someone near and dear to your family? So first and foremost, um, I was sexually assaulted by a pastor when I was 10 years old. And um, I think in the beginning, that just was like a domino effect of my innocence being taken, of my vulnerability. So in that instance, I learned how to lie, manipulate, deceive. I come from the background of, you know, what goes on in the home stays in the home. And so a lot of, I think a lot of that had to do with me just not being able to trust people. I told my mom, my grandmother, they didn't believe me. They told me, go, go somewhere and sit your fast ass down. Mm. I never forget, they told me that. And I'm, I took that as a sign of, you know, I'm in this world by myself. I can't trust anybody. And I think that started um, a lot of manipulation and deception within my mind. And I thought, well, I can't trust anybody. And then here comes, you know, a guy saying, so I was 14 years old. Here comes a guy saying, you know, you know, you don't have to deal with them. You know, um, I'm here. I love you because I wasn't getting told I was you know, loved at home. And I think that was a big deal. Like I, you know, tell young girls now that, you know, when you don't get it in the home, you're going to go find it somewhere. And so the first guy that told me, um, he loved me. I attached myself to him and not even six months into the relationship, uh, he was abusing me. And it started with a pinch, um, you know, shadow boxing, you know, and then next thing you know, I was getting bruises. I was getting choked out. I was having blackouts. So by the time I was a senior, um, I couldn't take my senior pictures cause my eyes was bruised. I had bruises, black eyes. I remember, but I, I ended up marrying my abuser the day I turned 18. I mean, it was a lot of abuse that happened in the sum of like four years. And I think that was just the beginning of me feeling like I'm in this world by myself. And, and of course, you know, you, you go through life just kind of feeling broken and alone and um, attaching myself. So I continue to attach myself to like-minded people that abused me. I remember saying one time I was like, I mean, do I have like, come get me, I'm vulnerable, I'm weak, I'm stupid on my forehead because every time I turned around, I was dealing with the same guys. You, you said you ended up marrying your abuser. What was it about that situation, you knowing that you shouldn't be getting beat, you shouldn't be dealing with those things that made you stay and eventually marry him? I just didn't think I could do any better. Um, I didn't have anybody to say, you, you look beautiful or you're worth, you know, you're worth more. And he was telling me that. And so some attention was better than none at all for me. And which is so sad because I look back now and I'm like, oh my God, you know, I don't think I'm stupid now. I thought I was so weak and stupid then, uh, but I knew it was wrong. I just didn't know how to get out. I didn't know how to get out. And with the, with the physical 
abuse, there's also that mental abuse, like you're saying, uh, um, almost beating you down so that you don't go look for better. Is, 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 uh, is that something that you look back on now and saying, yeah, mentally as well as physically? You know, sometimes I wonder, like, which one is, is better? I mean, mental or bruise, because, because, you know, I could deal with the bruises, they're gonna go away, but when someone has your mind and someone can dictate what you put on, where you go, how you move, you can't go to your mama's house, you, they take your telephone, uh, it's so many different facets of abuse, and so I often wonder now, like, I mean, which one is worse? I think all of them are just as equally important. Through, through your experiences, your life experiences, and your journey, mm -hmm. you know, to try and help women get back their power, you know, what, what sort of advice would you give or would you wish you would share with these players so they can use their platforms, much like your son, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, what sort of advice would you give women so that these young men can sort of help steer them in the right direction? I think, first of all, DeAndre listened to me. And I think, um, and I think in the beginning, DeAndre's father, we were in a car accident when DeAndre was six months old. And so all he had was me to listen to. And I made it very clear because think about it, I'm a woman like, and I've never, you know, I like I've never raised a man. I don't know how to do it. So I, um, I adapted discipline in my home like very early on. And I told him, you have 15 minutes to, to call your mama back. Like, I'm not playing with you. Don't have me chase you down because I will pull up on you. And so, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was one of them. And uh, the, the, uh, they, like, you know, I, I'm calm now, but I wasn't always calm. And so we, I just, that structure in my home, the discipline, and they had curfew and I set these things. And so when they came in late, I would like literally like lose my mind and act a fool. And I think those were some of the things I implemented into my home like very early on. So to answer your question, I think it was very big because I also believe that how he treat me is how he gonna treat his wife and his children and any other women in his family or, you know, the family that he uh, established or just women, period. I, I knew that he was going to go through life and I, always, I was never shy of telling him, you know, if you don't answer the phone for me, if you disrespect me, then you'll disrespect any woman. Mm. Look at how they treat, just, just sit back and listen. How they treat their mom is how they're gonna treat you. So I think it was very early on that I instilled in DeAndre and my other son that, you know, always, treat a woman like carefully, always listen, always, um, you know, be patient and understand and, and look back at how you treat me. So I think that was, we formed a really good relationship because I wouldn't settle for less. He had to treat me a certain way. He had to speak to me a certain way. He couldn't curse in front of me. Well, now, I mean, you know, now they let him slip, but <laughs> back then <laughs> they, you know, so yeah. Yes, ma'am. So uh, Josh Brown was a former punter in New York. Okay. And he eventually wrote a letter to friends chronicling his abuse of his wife. And he said in that letter that he felt like God and she was his slave. Mm. And he talked about the verbal and mental abuse that was added to the physical. When you met DeAndre's father, you said that was the first time you weren't physically abused, mm. but you did speak about some of the other things that went on that could be considered as abuse as well for people who don't understand the effects of mental and verbal abuse abuse or the abuse of believing one thing and trying to live a certain thing can you speak a little bit about that relationship and how that abuse also affected you yeah so when i met deandre's father um i was around 21 years old and this was the first man that had not abused me physically but all he knew was the dope game. All he knew was selling drugs. And so I was, I easily um, slid into that with him. He would sell to the men, I would sell to the women. I thought that was love. I thought it was cute. We was making money. We was able to go to the, to the jockey lot. Like you couldn't tell me nothing. We was able to like, you know, buy Christmas for all the kids. But what I learned was that still was a form of control because why, why can't I, you know, why couldn't I sell to the men? So it was, it was a form of isolation and control. 
And I think understanding that was too, that just because he didn't physically beat me, I didn't see it as control. I didn't see it as abuse. There are so many facets of abuse and we have to understand that when someone takes your phone, it's abuse. Uh, when someone tells you you can't use the laptop, it's abuse. When a I mean, when a girl pops you in the back of the head, you know, you're like, oh, stop. It's, no, no. It, it's just so many different facets, and we have to understand them all to understand what it is. I, I told you earlier, I said, um, when you are uncomfortable, it doesn't matter what it is. It is a form of abuse. When you are crying, like, because love doesn't hurt. It's not supposed to hurt. And I think me not understanding that, you know, we was, like I said, we were selling drugs and, you know, kind of just living the fast life and not knowing when the police was gonna come in and kick the door in, not knowing when they was gonna come take my children, that is like, you, that is mental abuse mm. at, at its highest. The night of the incident mm -hmm. where the lie and bleach are poured on you, mm -hmm. can you take us through the, what happened that night and also the emotions and pain of what you went through? It was midday, it was around noon, um, 2002. It was a beautiful July day, the sun was out. I had met a guy, had only been knowing him for about three and a half, maybe four months. I was in love. The first night we met, we was attached and he was like, you know, wouldn't leave the house. And I, I have this little th saying where I mashed the gas so fast. He had the keys to my house, my heart, and my children, access to everything in a matter of like a month. I remember telling this girl, and just this is how broken I was, and I, I told this girl about a month before, I said, um, I'm gonna get myself two months to get a boyfriend. Like, you know, am I, I'm thinking about like, who does that? You know, but I, I said that, and so sure enough, you know, I manifested that, and here he come. Well, unbeknownst to me, he had many of girlfriends, but this one in particular, a girl had, you know, she had called the house, and. Um, you know, I had kind of, I had a feeling that he was messing around with other people, but, you know, it was just the back and forth, the mind games, the playing, like, I love you, and then one minute, you know, so w once again, it wasn't physical, so I didn't see it as that bad. And um, so I was called to a, a house one day. He took, well, I woke up that morning, he took my car, my brand new Lexus, and he took the car, so I got a call about an hour or two later. I was pissed. I was walking around cussing. How, how did, like, how are you gonna take my brand new car? I had two other cars out there. Why didn't he take the other car? And so, anyway, he called me to a place, and I went there. I had no idea that this was a, a young lady's house. Um, and I get out, I see my car, and so we're wrestling. You know, he grabbed my arm, and we're wrestling, and I'm cussing. He's fussing, and he's like, you know, telling me, hey, I'm, you know, I'm only here because she, you know, she says she's pregnant. Like, she who? Like, what are you doing here? And so what I didn't know then, what I know now, the young lady was in her kitchen boiling a concoction of bleach and liquid red devil eye. So she was boiling this concoction as he's outside talking to me. So I would say about 15 minutes later, she runs out and she dashes this concoction onto me. She calls my name and she dashes onto me. And I instantly fall to my knees. I fall on my back and I'm out there with my skin. Everything is coming off um, a matter of seconds. I go completely blind. And um, I guess he panics and he picks me up. He puts me in the car. He rushes me to a gas station and he leaves me there. I say about five, 10 minutes late, he leaves me there to die. Because when I say to die is because he didn't call 911, he didn't get help. The cashier had to call 911. And um, eventually I was rushed to, um, I was medically rushed by a helicopter to uh, Augusta Burn Center. And I slid into a coma for a month. And uh, it, it was one of the worst, the most horrific things because all I could think about was when I did come out of the coma was who has my children. None of them had fathers that was in the home. It was just me, you know, and it was like, what have I done? Like these people had no regards for my life, my children. So DeAndre was 10 years old at the time. Uh, my baby girl was four. My daughter who's here is, was 14. And these kids barely in high school, you know, barely in middle school. And here I am, made all of these decisions 
that got me to this point that I'm a, now I'm about to like lose my life. How am I supposed to heal and pick my life up from this? I mean, this was like one of the worst mistakes of my life getting attached to these people. And then from, from there, moving forward, how did, like you're saying, you're doing <laughs> successful now, D-Hop, your daughter, I met your other daughter, we was at the hotel together. Yeah. The, the aftermath of that, getting out of a coma, being burnt, then now being blind, like that's the, that's the comeback story. Yeah. That's the, that's the one I want to hear. Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. I think being blind was, was oh, I mean, it's a major wake up call, right? You got four children, you trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to will my, will my, my way back to life. Um, before that, I was depressed for three and a half years, like in the bed, feeling like, you know, my face is swollen. Like, my thing was, with all of that, I had to go through all of that. I felt like God prepared me for such a time as this, but to go through all of that, I had a lot of time to think, a lot of time to get it right, a lot of time to heal my, my insides. Because back then, I mean, you know, people say, oh, you beautiful, you beautiful, but my insides didn't match my outsides. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you see these beautiful people and everything is good, but their insides is rotten, that was me. And so today, my outsides, I know match my, out, my insides because I put the work in. Mm -hmm. So what you see today is a woman who has said, you know what? Um, I'm not only gonna take my life back, but I'm gonna repair my family. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna stand up and be a woman to say, you know what, I acknowledge everything I've done I admit that, like, I'm, as much time as it took for me to damage those kids and have men running in and out, I'm gonna take just as much time to put the work in to repair that. Mm -hmm. And so those kids that you meet now with those smiles, it, that's because they got a mama that's saying, you know what, I messed up. Like, I, not just that day, I was broken way before um, they attacked me. Like, I was on a path of destruction. I just, I knew something was gonna happen, I just didn't know when. Because I was so, I was so broken inside and cussing and fussing and walking around and I thought the world owed me something because my innocence had been taken and man after man had abused me. So I was just, I was mad at the world. And I think I had to like really forgive myself first and understand that, you know, people do make mistakes. We are, we are mothers. You know, I was, I'm a sister, all of these things happen. And in order for the, the healing to take place, sometimes you gotta take a step back and realize, okay, let, let me apologize to these children. Let me sit them down, apologize one by one. Okay, because you, we can apologize, but then, then you want, now you're getting the ugly truth. Because if you ever wanna know anything about you, ask your children, baby, they are gonna tell you. So yes, I don't know about, you know, I mean, it, you know, it's like, and um, y'all will know one day when the babies grow up, you know, it's like, so I'm telling you not, don't do nothing wrong because they are gonna tell you about yourself. <laughs> but sitting there and asking them, hearing them one by one, um, hey, tell me how I messed up, what did I do? So I had to hear my, my boys tell me, I don't like when I see men in the house because, because it, it makes me feel bad. As the little boy, when y'all are arguing, I, there's nothing I could do about it. Just like yes, those little things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even think about that because I was one of those mothers, you know, do as I say and not as I do. And I thought because, and so being a mother doesn't make you right. And I think that's the biggest thing. We make mistakes and give us grace but just because we the mother and just because we raised you, it doesn't make us right. And I think there's a lesson just in that alone to understand that as a mother, you're not gonna always get it right. But ha just coming back around and saying, you know what, I'm sorry. Sometimes people just need to hear I'm sorry. Yes, and I know I'm not the only mother out there that has made like tons of mistakes. And then you have a son, you know, such as you guys that are saying, you know, mom, I just want to make it. Mom, I just want to be somebody. My mom just want to get us out of here. You know, so, and understand too, if your mother never, your, if your mother never tells you I'm sorry or never tells you, hey, you know, I did something wrong, then understand too that, you know, maybe she doesn't have the tools or she didn't have, you know, things put into her to say I'm sorry because I'm saying I'm sorry, but I have a mother that did some things to me and it's hard for her to say I'm sorry. So I think that we, we, we just have to like put the work in, understand that, 
and, and not wait for somebody to give you something. If you really want to repair that family, you really want to rebuild that family, then it's up to you to put the work in. Be the first, be a first generation of, of you doing it. Yes, Don't wait on, I mean, we all can't wait on the I'm sorry's or the, you know, hey, I did you wrong. Yes, I got done wrong, but I'm not sitting around waiting on that because guess what? I don't want my children's children to have to endure what I endure. So, I, like, I don't have an option to, but to get it right, right now. <laughs> Trauma is real. So I want to say, first and foremost, I admire <laughs> your courage. Oh, thank you. You know, for sharing your, your message and your journey. And, um, and I want to challenge the fellas in the room because we are a brotherhood. Mm -hmm. um, I think right now, the message, uh, y'all know what happened with Diddy and, and Cassie mm -hmm. and that entire thing. I think the message now has shifted to preventative. Mm -hmm. How do we take preventative measures uh, to, to ensure that this doesn't happen as, as much? Not to say that it will all go away, mm -hmm. but that it doesn't happen uh, as much. We have a great platform. You know, you guys have been for an amazing opportunity to have this sort of uh, job. It's a, it's a, it's a luxury mm -hmm. at the very end of the day, but you have a platform and, and you have to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that window is going to close. So you want to take advantage of the time you have now to try and convey those messages. So, Ms. Greenlee, if you, can, if you can lean on the brotherhood, these young men that are in here, what sort of message would you like for them to convey hoping that they can help this happen less or occur less. I think in lieu of everything that you're seeing on the TV and everything that has been going on, I mean, why not take that as exactly what it is? Like, abuse is rampant, it's real. And from a mother's standpoint, you know, you, you go out on the Little League field or Pop Warner and you you go through your whole career, you know, playing football. This is what you want. This is what you want. And then in one moment, in one instance, everything can be taken away from you. And why is it that, why is it that you get to that point? And so I think if I could say anything, it is to like, if you know if you're angry. I think physical abuse comes from anger. It comes from um, trauma that has not been worked on. If you know that there's some things that has happened in your life, you know, I'm sitting here representing your mother, your sister, your daughter, and every, and every woman in your life. And I'm saying, you know what? Um, I get it. I'm sorry. Things are going to happen. But you're going to have to, there's going to come a point when you're going to have to stand up and be accountable for who you are and not, be, and not blame your mother, not your father, things that happened to in your past, because those things, if you were to sit those people down today and ask them, hey, you know, what did you do and why did you do that? They probably won't even remember. So I think we have to, you have to hold yourself accountable for everything that's going to get you to that angry place in your life and deal with it. Like deal with your mess. It's mess. It shouldn't have happened. It's not right. But what do you, like, where you are now in your platform now, you have no idea how many people are watching you at all times, little boys, little girls, and they're taking, and so don't be the next one on the news that, that I got to hear about, you know, that you put your hands on a woman or a man, or in that one instant, you got angry, you know, and then now your whole life is, is in shambles. They're taking this thing serious. And so if you don't take accountability of your anger issues and what's going on in your life, then who will? You know, we've had different stories of domestic abuse in the NFL. Uh, Javon Belcher of the Kansas City Chiefs years ago is the one that truly sticks out. It ended in murder, suicide. And in a lot of these instances and cases, this isn't the first time that domestic abuse or domestic violence has occurred in those individuals' mm -hmm. lives. You had to forgive yourself first, and I'm sure in order to move forward, forgive some of the people that have harmed you. But if you had an opportunity to speak to them, to talk to them about what their actions did to you, what would you say to the men that abused you throughout your life? The woman I am now, I would say, um, I, I forgive you. 
because when I look back, I was, I was a, trying to be a fixer. So for every, every person that abused me, they were damaged, they were angry. And, and so I stepped in as their mother that left them, the mother that abandoned them, the mother that cursed them out, the mother that treated them like crap. And I was just like trying to be the fixer. And so I say, I forgive you for everything that you've done to me, not knowing that you were damaging me in the process too, another woman, you know, so I turned into somebody's mother and you didn't care. But today I would say, I forgive you because in me forgiving them, it frees me. Mm. And I need to be free in order to raise my grandbabies, you know, and to be able to talk to them and to wake up and just be free. I don't want to be in bondage anymore. And so I would say, you know, I forgive you. I, I truly forgive you. Man, it's, it's simple and I'm country, but man, <laughs> Would y'all, would, would any one of y'all beat up a nine-year-old? Would y'all hit a little kid? I don't know. So then why'd you hit a woman? Like I... a fight, think about competitiveness. A fight is two people trying to decide who's tougher, right? Mm -hmm. You a big ass dude hitting on a woman, that's not a fight. Mm -hmm. That's an ass kicking. Like what, the, what sense does that make? You know what I'm saying? And I know, and another thing too, because I saw, I saw domestic violence growing up. I saw my <laughs> uncle. Mm. Ray, he played ball too, played for the Bucks, beat up my Aunt Gail. I knew that was wrong, but some people, it, they, it doesn't turn over for them because, oh, okay, daddy hit mommy, whatever, un uncle hit auntie. Mm -hmm. Like, if it didn't turn over for you, anybody out there has that, just think about that, man. A fight, a competitive physical altercation is supposed to decide who's tougher. Why you want to do that with a woman? And how, I would say, Miss Sabrina, how, how would you with your kids and with them seeing domestic violence, like breaking that generational curse. And that's what I'm kind of talking about. Any of y'all that saw it, it's, a, it's something in your mind that that might be okay now, man. That's not okay. You had to break that, that generational curse of thinking that's okay in the household. Nine times out of 10, when you have seen abuse, you go on to be an abuser. And I think that is the biggest misconception because that you don't have to do that. I mean, when you want to like change the whole cycle, you sit there and you see your mama get beat up behind closed doors and then you go and turn and do the same thing out of anger or out of control or isolation. It's like, what kind of man wants to like keep a woman bound and down and I mean, it's, it, that's not a man, that's a boy. And um, I, I just, and then you go on to have a son and then what is your son supposed to, think when, you know, he got his daddy sitting there, you know, telling his mama what to do. And then your mama, and then the mama turns around, she's not speaking highly of you because you done like battered her and beat her up. And so it just goes on and on and on. And the cycle goes on and on and on. And like he said, I mean, you wouldn't put your hands on a nine or 10 year old. So what make you think you put your, uh, you put your hands on a woman that's five foot two and you six foot five. It makes no sense. It's not even. Yes, ma'am. It, it's not an even fight at all. Yes, well, he said it nice. Honestly, man, like, <laughs> be, like, be straight up, man. You put your hands on a woman, yeah. you a bitch. You... Right? Like, it ain't really... What he said. There, there, there shouldn't be, like... <laughs> there, there really isn't any... There, there shouldn't be blurred lines about that, right? And if one of your homeboys putting his hands on a woman and you don't tell him about himself, you a bitch, too. Like, real talk. And I understand the locker room. The locker room is the most forgiving place in the world, right? Because we all come from different ethnicities, from different upbringings, from different races, and we all come in here and we're trying to win a championship. And because we're trying to win a championship, if the rules say that that person could be in your locker room, you find a way to coexist with that person. But that doesn't mean that we gotta make everything all right, right? Like I got a saying and I live by it. All my teammates wasn't my friends, all my friends wasn't my teammates. You know what I'm saying? Like all of us weren't like-minded. Right? We weren't all gonna rock together. Some of us got kids and are married. Some of us are still young and can be in the streets. Like, I can't go hang with that dude every day. But from whatever time we get to work, from whatever time we leave, like, we're teammates. Like, I get that. But, like, at some point, we gotta break that locker room mentality in some ways when it comes to things like this so our homeboy doesn't end up killing his girlfriend, killing himself, 
and leaving his baby to be in the foster care system or to fend for itself and have to deal with the trauma of what we did, mm -hmm. right? And like, I get it. Like, I want to come here and say, hey man, don't do dumb shit so you can keep playing ball. But I got a 25 year old daughter. I got a 19 year old daughter. I don't want to tell you don't do dumb shit and keep your hands to yourself so you can keep playing football. I want to tell you that so you can protect those young ladies, right? I want to tell you that so when your daughter is looking up to you, when your daughter is growing up, like you understand, I have to protect her. And part of protecting her is keeping my damn hands to, my, to myself when it comes to her mother, mm -hmm. right? It's treating her in a way that I show her what respect look like. Yes, I show her what protection looks like, right? I show her what it feels like to be loved in the right way. And we can't do that if we aren't treating the women that we are tasked with protecting in the way that we're supposed to, right? And we gotta hold each other accountable as well. You mentioned, Ms. Sabrina, you mentioned DeAndre and being like, I gotta get us out of here. I gotta make it. He left school early. Mm -hmm. I think he had like 1,400 yards, 18 touchdowns in his last year, ends up being drafted uh, 27th, I believe it was, by the Texans. First round. Yes, don't forget that. It was it's for show first round. <laughs> it's, it's for, no, it's for, it's for sure. You know. Oh, if that wasn't a mama. <laughs> so for sure, first round. What are those? What are those moments like when? Because you don't get an opportunity. You haven't got an opportunity to see him play since he was 12. I have not. But what are those moments like when he scores a touchdown? You hear his name said over the speakers in the arena, he comes over to you and hands you the football. I mean, I'm proud. I, I, a lot of people don't know DeAndre's um, junior year, uh, no, yeah, junior year in college. He came back home because I couldn't afford to pay the rent, the mortgage, and it was only $540. So he came home and um, brought, dumped all his clothes off and he didn't stay there, of course, you know how that goes, but he was there just so that, you know, he could take the Pell Grant money and the, um, the housing money and pay, and help me pay, pay the mortgage. So you're talking about um, a young man that would go out and just run miles and miles and come back drenched in sweat. So I think, it, like for me now, or even him being in the league 12 years, or even him giving me the ball when he scores, it doesn't surprise me. I'm proud, but he put the work in. And he has great worth ethics, and he just like, he's determined. He's always determined to just do better and be better. And so when he gives me the ball, I'm just like, I think about those days when my door was unlocked, and he just went out and ran and ran and ran, and just, you know, and I'm fussing, and I'm, I'm well, I'm raising hell, because I'm <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, you done left my door unlocked again. But I knew he was, you know, he was just out running for hours and hours. He wanted it. He wanted it real bad. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm a proud mama, but I don't get too overly excited because when someone wants it that bad, you know it's going to happen mm -hmm. in some way. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, so, guys, I don't know if you all have questions, but we did want to give you an opportunity. I can't put myself in a woman's place that has been abused or that is being abused. I don't believe that many of you sitting in these seats can, but we have someone who has been through it, who has persevered, who has become an inspiration as well through her story. So if there are any questions that you have, I didn't want to continue to ask the questions. And if you guys have questions and you don't want them on camera and you don't want those things to be recorded, just let me know. But the biggest thing for us is we wanted to do, we were excited about being a part of this because we could do something different than what the NFL always does, right? And we have one of our own brethren's mother who has gone through this, who is willing to open up and be vulnerable with you guys. So if anybody has any questions, now would be the time to ask. Um, if we have a niece or a cousin or a sister that we feel is in like a abusive, like a, a terrible relationship, like, how would you, what do you think we could do to, like, help in a way that, like, because, you know, relationships get a little funny when it comes to, like, you know, love and, and feeling like you need this person. Like, how, mm -hmm. how best, how best could I or someone I know, like, help this person in my family? I think, first of all, just continue to support her. And 
as many times as you can get her alone and pour into her and just be like, you know, I, I think telling her that he's no good for her is just gonna drive her closer to him. And so just allowing her to know that you're there and that you're, you know, hey, I'm watching you, I see you, I love you. And just like giving her compliments and continue to telling her you love her. Now, if you know that he's being abusive to her, then you need to figure out how to get her some help. I founded a, a nonprofit, Smooth, my organization. So I'm kind of on the other side of it. I deal with women that um, have been abused. Um, I take them out, I take them shopping, you know, show them love and everything. So that's why I come from a, like a love perspective, a perspective of, you know, I'm gonna pour back into you and kind of build you back up. But if you, if you just know that he's no good, then like I said, just be there for her. But if there's any type of signs of abuse, then step up. And telling her leave him alone or, or going to beat him up, that's just gonna put them closer back together. So, I mean, r real talk, I've been there and did that. I mean, my daddy came with a gun and he was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shoot him and all this stuff. And it just made me look at him like, oh my God, like, you know, my daddy, my daddy gonna shoot him. Let's run, let's run away together. You know, so it's just, mm -hmm. it's just those type of like silly mentality, the, the thinking that uh, young girls do. Um, just like I said, just keep talking to her, let her know you're there. And every chance you get, like, let her know, like, you know, she, she's like, she's so much better than what she's doing. Yes, ma'am. In your, in your memoir, um, Grant Me Vision, <laughs> what is it that you want people to be able to get, you know, from your story of faith, family, you know, and forgiveness? So my memoir, um, first of all, it comes out July 9th. It's on pre-order now. Go get it. <laughs> So in, um, you mentioned, uh, so Grammy Vision, I mean, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in there. I lost two brothers, um, one in a car accident, and I, I held him while he took his last breath at the age of 14. He was 12 when he died. My other brother got shot in Atlanta by the police in 97. So, and then, of course, the attempted murder on my life. So it's been a, it's, I mean, all of these chapters are in here. So. I don't take for granted that everybody has been through a lot of stuff, but this is one woman that just like kept defying the odds and kept, you know, kept it's like, like every time I turn around, it was just something happening. And I wanted people to really see, Ryan, that there is life after death. And that, you know, if you just forgive yourself and forgive the people that, that kept offending you and kept, kept hurting me per se, that, I mean, you can make it. I don't care what it looks like, what it feels like, whether it's your mama. We, I, I just want, in, especially you guys, taking away from my story that we all have mamas at home and sisters and stuff. And I just say, you know, when you talk to your mom, like, and, cause like, it's rare that people just gonna come from humble beginnings and they just come from some real shit, you know? Just smile. Don't tell DeAndre I cuss. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> come from some real stuff. And it's like, I want, I want to be able to be that, <laughs> be that, that woman that, you know, that you see that somebody made it. Mm -hmm. And if she can make it, then my mama can get off them drugs. If she can make it, then, you know what I'm saying, my mama maybe can leave that man. I, I really want people to see that, that there is hope, you know? And I'm still putting the work in. I'm single on purpose because I'm, you know, I get up every day, and if, if there's something that I need to try to fix about myself, like, I want to be able to attach to somebody whole and complete. And so just recognizing that alone is like, that's big. Like, that's major. I don't want to keep going through life making, making mistakes and having, and then blaming other people and pointing fingers. So I think in this book, it's a woman that has put the work in to say, you know what? I, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep getting it right until I get it right. And every day I wake up, I'm going to keep acknowledging my wrong. You know, I'm going to stay in a place where I'm not easily offended because all this, this stuff that's happened to me. But I know that if I just keep getting up and putting the work in, then I'm doing it for me now. I'm doing it, you know, because it matters to me. I don't care what other people think. You know, I don't, like, these, the, cause these people that offended me, like I said, these people that hurt me, 
they're long gone. They don't, they don't care, you know, that I have generations after generations that I'm trying to get into the NFL and the NBA and, you know, and, and all this stuff. You know, it's like, for real, like these kids, my grandbabies are watching me now, and it matters now. So I think, you know, um, did I say go get Grammy Vision? Did I say yeah, that you already? Said it. <laughs> you told him, and you told him the date. Sure? And it's on pre-order. And it's on, did I say that yes, already? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just check. <laughs> you lied. You lied. <laughs> <laughs> see. Yes, ma'am. I think, um, fellas, uh, on a serious note, though, uh, go get the book. Yeah. And it ain't just about, like, just getting mm -hmm. a book. It's about getting a book and sharing it. Like, just buy multiple co copies and, like, what our podcast, what we always try to do, because we've been in those same seats, yeah. We try our best to give back through transparency. If you look around other podcasts doing stuff, it's all fun and jokes and this and that. And we do have those moments because this dude right here. Yeah. But we don't we don't we don't lead with drama. Yeah. Like we lead with positivity and really trying to do what's right and making sure we we deliver a message. It's about building up building up people and not breaking them down, building communities. Absolutely. So if you're able to get this book and just share it with maybe a young, a young guy, mm -hmm. your foundation, or other women, so they can see what happened to one of your brothers, DeAndre's mom, through complete transparency in her story and journey, maybe we can help circumvent a lot of what's going on in, this, uh, in society. And, and the simple part of it is, it start, it's about respect and value. And that, that starts with you as men. Mm -hmm. You gotta respect yourself enough and value yourself enough or it's 100% certain that you'll lose it. You're gonna lose yourself. If you don't respect, whatever you don't respect the value, it's almost 100% certain you lose it. Mm -hmm. The NFL has program after program that they try to uh, give us, even when I was in those seats. They always try to give back through player development, all that stuff. We get bored, we kind of drift off, and then later on down the road, you hear da -na -na, da -na, that asshole's on, that knucklehead's on TV for doing what they just said not to do. So if you don't respect yourself enough or respect this job and this opportunity that you've earned, you're gonna lose it. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with a woman or anything else. So I say that to say, I'm going I know the pivot is gonna buy a few copies and we're gonna give them out. And if you guys can too, I think that would help not just Ms. Greenlee's mission and her foundation organization, what she's trying to do and help other women recover from domestic abuse, mm -hmm. but it also puts you guys' mind at peace knowing that you were a part of the solution to anybody that have helped or are able to go forth in their journey with recovery. So that's my ask for y'all, bruh, and it's inexpensive, and I know it is because I've seen a lot of y'all cars in the parking lot. So, <laughs> but no, nah, seriously, uh, support her cause because I'm sure it's taken a lot of courage for her to come and speak to you guys, a room full of men, uh, mm -hmm. in hopes that, um, you know, she can get that support. So that's my two cents, I'm done. Any other uh, questions? How did I gain my power back was just taking it one day at a time and aligning myself with like-minded people. And so I cut off all of my friends that I used to hang with you know, no more going out drinking Hennessy, no more going to the strip clubs, no more doing all of that. Like, I wanted to align myself with people that thought like me, looked like me, and wanted to be better than me. And so I started going to church and I started, you know, just trying to find some type of peace. I think for me, it was getting in a church-based home. And so, and, um, and just isolating myself from men. Like, I took, I took a grace period. Like, it was, I think I did it more so for my children because I had made so many mistakes. So they was, they was like watching my every move. And I was like, you know, I, I just didn't want to make mistakes. I didn't want to attach myself to somebody broken. And um, so I think the, the best advice I could give is to just allow her the, the space to, to grow and be there. You know, like I said, just be there for her and tell her, like I said, for me, it was, it was me just taking that time out to just be by myself, like love on myself, um, cherish myself. And I think be kind to myself because I was, I was hard on myself. And so now, like, 
I walk with grace and I'm like, you know what? Like, let me be kind to myself. Let me go do something for myself today. Like, let me love on myself today, yes, you know? Um, and if nobody else loves me, then I'm going to wake up and love me. So, and then also, too, for me, it was just educating myself. Like, what is abuse? What does that look like? And for me, you know, it come, like I said, it comes in so many different ways. I just didn't want to get caught back up in the same thing. So, like, I'm educated on what it looks like now. Um, and not understanding that somebody can just come in and tell me anything. So I think the, your second question is just knowing who I am. Like really, really, really knowing who I am and what I stand for and being able to just like show up. I so like I, I walk in any room and I'm like, there's nobody in there that's inferior to me. I pour this into women all the time. You know, there is only one you. And baby, you got to make the best of you. So I think just if I could, you know, tell your sister anything, if you could tell her anything, it's just like, you know, follow me on Instagram, read the book, look at my story, and just be like, you know what, that woman is powerful. And she, she wasn't always like that. But encourage her to just know who she is and her power is, is very important. And uh, smooth is speaking mentally, outwardly opening opportunities toward healing. Mm -hmm. That's the name of her foundation. That's the acronym. And I think it goes a lot to, you know, what you were asking. Through that journey, what have you discovered that love actually is? Mm. That's a good question. Oh. Great question. For me, love is peace. Like, Love's give me, love, when, when I tell somebody I love them, I mean it, I expect that back. But for me, love is a peace of mind. Like, and, and I know that sounds so cliche, but everybody that really, really says they love me now, it brings me a peace of mind. It's easy, it's kind, like it's, it, it, it doesn't hurt, it feels good. And you have to know the definition of love. Love is exactly what it is. It's, it's love. And I know that's not like a, a, a brief answer, but for me, it, it's just, it's like I smile when, when I think about love. And it's just so easy. I remember the days when I was walking behind a man in a grocery store and I was told I couldn't look up because mm. I couldn't make eye contact. But he mm. loved me. Right? The opposite of that is peace. When, I, when I'm sitting at home now and I'm listening to a book on Alexa and I'm just smiling because now I know, you know, now I know what love is. It's like, it's that comfort of just knowing that if nobody else loves you, you can just love yourself regardless of what's going on around you. You just, I'm sitting there and I'm listening to my book on Audible. I'm drinking my coffee. And I just love myself. <laughs> That's love. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, like you said, man, as a brotherhood, we love y'all boys. Mr. Brand, that was beautiful. And just your <laughs> like your openness is amazing. I just I, I love I just love going through the journey with you. But I'm gonna help y'all boys out. If y'all feel like hitting a woman, call me. We could just lock up. <laughs> Seriously, like if y'all get the urge, the anger that y'all want to hit a woman, call myself and I'll fly up here. I'm not saying I'm the toughest dude in the world now, not, but you I'm better bring your insurance card and the lunch. So I'm, I'm going to give that to y'all. You can put it on the board somewhere. If y'all feel like hitting a woman, give me a call. We'll lock up anytime, anywhere. Okay? Deal? Hey, he was certainly arrested at Florida. Um, oh, no. I ain't scared of three hots in a cot now. <laughs> I would just say go check out my website, smoothing.org. Um, it's me pouring into women. I ha I'm in three states. I have um, women in these three states that, you know, on the other side of the abuse is women that are really going through it. Um, and these women go through sex trafficking. They, you know, they go out here, they get exploited, all because a man decided to put their hands on them. So I think that that domino effect, let's keep in mind that, you know, we have mothers and children and, you know, I just, I want to be able to one day wake up and not have to work so hard. 
at, at, at talking to these women and having to uplift them and, you know, just continuously pouring into them and telling them, you know, it's going to be okay. And then some of these women I never hear from again. Some of these women, you know, I've, I've been called to funerals where, you know, a guy shot a nine-month-old nine woman. So I had to, like, talk to this family when the woman was in the casket and the baby was laying there beside her, mm. dead. It's real out here. And so I know that I just appreciate the pivot and this Thank platform you. with these guys. And, you know, we can't even express it enough that it's, it's some real stuff going on out here. You see this stuff on TV, that's nothing compared to what a woman have to, like you saw what, like you saw that, but imagine having to get, get drug and get hit every single day, day after day, week after week, year after year. You know what that does to a soul? Mm. And so I just say, be mindful of the souls out here, you know, and put and put me out of work, um, <laughs> you know, yes, and, and, and like I, I want to be able to just wake up and not have to go somewhere and talk about, you know, domestic violence and abuse. But it's real. It is so real and it's so relevant. And um, and just also too, guys, be mindful of your pr platform, you know, use it for good and get out here and do some good things. I know you'll go far. And how I know is because you're sitting here and you humble yourself to listen to, you know, an older woman like me and, and these guys. But I, I think that if we could, if I could instill anything that you take from this, that abuse is real. And um, I just want to, like I said, go to smoothinc.org, go check out my website and just, you know, if you want to see some real stuff, you want to see some women smiling, that's what we do. But on the other side of that, like, I had to put the work in to get that woman to that place. And so I just want you guys to just understand that abuse is real, and um, I, I wish the best for all of you, and I don't ever want to see you on TV. Yes, um, I don't want to look up one day and see any of you on TV from the Cleveland Browns, and I'm not playing. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Fellas, uh, thank you so much. I would leave y'all with this, bro. Like, uh, love is not ownership. We don't get to own humans. We experience them. We don't get to control them. And if you're ever thinking that that's cute because she can't wear something or she can't look mm, up or so she good. can't use her phone or she can't do anything, just remember, man, that control is the exact opposite of love. We appreciate you guys for our time. One more time for Mr. Greener. Yes, man, you were awesome. Thank you so much. Yes, man. You were amazing. How you doing? Appreciate your family. Big dog. Thank you so much. Yes, man. Yes, man. Yes, man. Appreciate you. Strong black man. Come on. Great team. Thank you for the today. Thank you. Thank you. Hold up. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling, got me up. On the mission, got me up. Knowing me, I got the key. On the vision, I can trust. Trust. Limitless. Take a stomach cap, pin in it. I thought they here to witness it. Got my people feeling militant. Way I'm feeling.